Welcome back to Stars and Miss. When people look at the moon, they often see familiar shapes. What do you see when you look at the moon? Personally, I see the darker Maria, which means seas in Latin, and they have vast basal plains from ancient lava flows. This dark surface becomes in our imagination sometimes a man, a rabbit, or a frog. This episode begins a three-part journey following one of the most widespread myths in the world, the animals we see on the moon. We'll start in China, where the toad and the rabbit are tied to the moon, the immortality elixir and divination. In the next episodes, we'll follow the rabbit across the globe and step back to ask what these stories reveal about our myths spread and evolve. We'll meet Chango and the story of a travel to the moon, a tale that has been told for more than 2,000 years. The Chinese moon vehicle is named after Chang'e, showing how some myths travel through time and space. To understand the breadth of that story, will also give you a short introduction to how divination worked in ancient China, a technique that even prefigures the binary system of a computer. Myths change with time, and therefore no version is a definitive one. On the 7th to 8th century mirror, we see the moon goddess with a rabbit, reflects the story of Chang Hu. Chang'e is associated with the moon, as we know, and after taking the elixir of immortality from the queen mother of the west, she flew to the moon and transformed into a toad, the moon spirit. Let's zoom in to see Chang'e with a toad. She has a lunar disc with a hair, busy pounding medicine with a mortar and pestle. And these lunar motifs are not late invention. The moon with a toad and a rabbit was already represented in the 2nd century BC. The moon has a symbolic importance in China. Within the yin-yang system, the sun aligned with the masculine and the moon with the feminine. Chronicles speak of myros that focus sunlight to make fire. But more surprisingly, also of a moon mirror said to make dew water from moonlight. Water is a symbolic opposite of fire. There's physics behind that poetry. During clear nights, nights are colder because clouds aren't trapping Earth's outgoing radiation. Surface cool and a piece of metal left out can be wet with dew in the morning, a ritual mirror could indeed pull water out of moonlight. The toad in the crescent with the rabbit is seen here on the banner found in the tomb from the Han period. The tomb of Lady Di contains an incredible number of artifacts. On the top corner, barely visible, is an image of a moon crescent with a toad and a rabbit close by. The sketch make it better visible. The story of Chang'e has several connections to life and healing. The rabbit is seen on the moon preparing, according to many authors, some immortality medicine. The story appears for the first time in a divinatory book. Many ancient Chinese books are recorded on bamboo slip. And the image here shows an old example. One of the most famous books, the Gui Chang, was lost for over 2,000 years till a version was found in a bog in 1993. The book, dated to the 4th century BC, contains the earliest known mention of Chang'e's journey. Before flying with the elixir, Chang'e Ask an oracle, and the omen was fav favorable. The oracle describes the travel as dangerous yet potentially prosperous. 
well, good judgment for leap toward immortality. So, to fully understand our story, we must first understand this practice. Let's explore how divination worked in ancient China and explains its surprising link to binary numbers. Divinatory stalks are traditionally yarrow, called in Latin Achillea milfolium, the herb tied to the Greek Achilles and praised by Pliny for healing wounds. Across culture, yarrow's antiseptic use made it a natural ritual tool. Around 1700, the French Jesuit Beauvais sent Leibniz a chart of the hexagram that you see here. Leibniz is a famous mathematician who is credited, together with Isaac Newton, with the invention of differential calculus. Leibniz immediately saw a positional binary structure, adding with a pencil numbers onto the diagram. Pencil marks still visible. Here are two examples. In the system Leibniz was analyzing, the readings start from the top, or at least that's how he analyzed the document. On the left, Leibniz established the code for the system. A broken line represents a zero, and a solid line represents a one. <coughs> On the right, it deciphers an hexagram as the number 11. So reading from the top, the first solid line gives us a 1. The second solid line gives us a 2. We skip the third line. The fourth solid line gives us 8. If we add them up, 1 plus 2 plus 8 makes 11. This representation is not an invention of Leibniz, but is found within the original ancient Chinese book. It's quite remarkable. Let's give an example of a possible divination. It's one among many different approaches. A classic divination method begins with 49 yarrow stalks. One is set aside, leaving us with 48. The diviner splits this bundle, in this example, into 13 and 35 sticks. After that, he groups each half into small bundles four, counting the remainder on each side, which can be 0, 1, 2, or 3. In our example, the remainder is 1 on the left and 3 on the right. Now the magic. Because 48 is divisible by 4, the two reminders will always add up to either 0 or 4. This clever method is a key to the entire process. It reduces all possibilities to just two outcomes. If the bundle had been divided in two bundles of 24, both reminders would have been 0, and the sum would have also been 0. The result is then assign a binary value, 0 if the sum is 0, and 1 if the sum is 4. This procedure is repeated six times to obtain the sixth line of an hexagram, resulting in a number between 0 and 63. While this may seem overly complex, there is more to it than impressing an audience. Each outcome as a different probability, one fourth for zero and three fourths for one in, in this case. It's a very useful feature in divination that not all odds are the same. It's fascinating that one of the 64 hexagrams is associated with Chang Hu's journey to the moon. The fact that her story is used in divination shows its profound importance in Chinese culture. The Cheng Hu hexagram is often interpreted as an omen for a challenging journey that is worthwhile undertaking. 
After having related the story of Chang'o to divination theory, let's return to the evolution of the myth itself. An earlier manuscript, dated to the mid-3rd century BC, preserved an older version of the Enghu story that mentions only the toad. It suggests that the toad on the mood motif predates the rabbit in China. But we cannot be completely sure, as the rabbit was also part of ancient culture. See here an example of a Neolithic ceramic that features toads or frogs, creatures tied to water and transformation and an extension to the moon. The rabbit is a classic fertility symbol with a short, roughly 30 to 40 day gestation, suggesting a, a close alignment with the lunar cycle. Many jade objects show rabbit from a very early time. We began with a frog and air that our eyes find in the locked face of the moon. We found that an animal of the moon is connected to Chang'hu, which stands at the core of Chinese culture, intertwined with knowledge in mathematics, medicine, and even physics. We stepped into divination with the stock method prefiguring ideas in computer science. Next time, we'll discuss the distribution of the hair or rabbit and the toad or the frog in the world. It will be a journey from Africa to Northern Eurasia with a short stop in England to mention Shakespeare. We'll investigate the global prevalence of this motive and will be confronted with a difficult challenge about the origin of some of these stories. In here, the main references, if you want to dig into that topic. See you next time. Bye.